Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Banyagali. Uh, I am the director of the arts at Colorado College, and it is really wonderful to see you all tonight. Um, on behalf of the music department and the arts at CC, thank you for being here for the butterfly effect. Um, we're fortunate at Colorado College to have an innovative and collaborative group of faculty, staff, and students. Um, together, we have a deep commitment to the ways that we can better understand the world around us um, through the lens of the arts. Uh, the arts bring us all together through our shared humanity, our creativity. Um, they honor and, um, diverging and converging perspectives. Um, they create opportunities to experience the familiar and the unfamiliar, uh, the expected and the unexpected at, at every turn. And this happens all the time, especially here um, at Colorado College. Um, this morning I had the opportunity to sit in with Professor Liliana Carrizo's class, uh, Musical Tapestries of the American Southwest. And this class just returned from an eight-day trip through northern New Mexico. And um, for two hours, I got to listen to this really captivating group of students talk about what Professor Carrizo described as the magical moments of the experience. Um, and there's two themes that emerged uh, from that. The, the, the importance of being present and the notion of interconnectedness. Um, and for me, that's the butterfly effect in a nutshell. Uh, it's the power and beauty of our interconnectedness and of being present. Um, I may be wrong about that because like most people my age, everything I know about chaos theory, I learned from Jurassic Park. <laughs> Um, so by means of introducing the instigator of tonight's program, um, I would like to uh, observe that the incredible liberal arts assemblage that will soon be before us on the stage um, has also been subject to the winds of change. It's something different than we originally envisioned, um, but it's even more wonderful as a result. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the proverbial butterfly at the center of all of this, uh, the chair of the CC Music Department and composer extraordinaire, Ofer Benamotz. Thank you, Ryan, for your opening remarks, and many thanks to you and to the Office of Arts at Colorado College for supporting today's event, today's program. There are many other individuals that have made this evening possible and deserve a big thank you for their hard work. First, I would like to thank all of our presenters this evening. So we'll start with Sovi Butani, a senior double major in math and computer science, Professor Shane Burns from the Physics Department, Professor Jamil Paulin from the Art Department. Thank you also to our special guest this evening, visual artist Karen Mosbacher there behind the canvas. Yeah. <laughs> Poet and documentary filmmaker Zach Benamotz. And in absentia, currently watching us from Brazil, Sage Bear a writer who contributed a short fiction story to our event. Uh, special thanks to my colleague and co-chair of the music department, pianist Susan Grace. I don't see Susan. I see you in the back. Oh. <laughs> For practicing my recent piece, uh, The Butterfly Effect, and she will be performing its American premiere later this evening. Finally, the deepest gratitude goes to our team at the music office, Lisa Manring, uh, Liz Manring, Lisa Gregory, Kate Nelson, who is going to be arranging the stage, and Justin Mikey, who is in the back recording and making sure the technology works. They all helped in coordinating and putting this event together. Thank you all so very much. This large-scale cross-disciplinary collaborative event started about two and a half years ago in October 2019 just a few months before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the music department hosted a young, the young Spanish Catalan pianist and mathematician, Laura Farrer Rosada. Laura gave a concert lecture here in Packard Hall, in this very same hall where she spoke about music and mathematics. She performed a series of pieces, showed some slides and explained how mathematical procedures within musical contexts can help in memorizing post-tonal music. There were two obvious groups in the audience. Students and faculty of the math department were sitting here, and on the other side there were the, um, the department of music, student and faculty too, so 
uh, we were kind of divided. When Laura Farrazada spoke about music, uh, everyone on this side of the hall seemed very happy and nodded uh, with their heads in agreement and understanding. When she started talking about mathematics, however, uh, the math department on the other side of the hall suddenly woke up and got very interested, while we musicians uh, got completely lost and started looking either on the floor or to the ceiling. So <laughs> that was the, the experience. However, at the end of her visit, Laura asked me to compose for her a solo piano work uh, that is based on mathematical concept of my choice. And we agreed that I will be using the Fibonacci series as the basis for my composition. Uh, the subject of the butterfly effect, which is connected to the Fibonacci series, can be inspiring in many ways. But in the summer of 2020, we all had just one thing on our mind, and that was the COVID global pandemic. When it occurred to me that the pandemic works along the same concept as the butterfly effect, I already knew how I was going to structure my new composition. In the summer of 2020, I completed the butterfly effect and shortly thereafter, the work was published by my dear friend uh, and publisher, Phil Erklen, and his CCC Music Publishing Company. Wait, well, Phil, Phil is here, yeah. Uh, the way from there to the collaborative event, event has been very short. Uh, in my quest to present the music in live performance, I ask colleagues to join me and present what they associate with the butterfly effect, either artistically or scientifically. The result of this exploration is what we are going to experience this evening. Uh, I would like to invite, uh, here she's already on stage, Karen Mosbacher, the visual artist, my new friend, visual artist, Karen Mosbacher, will describe her part in the collaboration. Thank you. Before I tell you what I'm about to do this evening, I want to recognize my team members. They helped me create this wonderful rendition of the golden spiral on the back of the panel on which I will paint. There's a photo in the front of your program, should you not be able to see that very well, at your angle. Many thanks to Cass Mullane, if you'll raise your hand, and Albie Johnson, <clears throat> for the last five months of working out this prototype, it was a lot of fun and a lot of sweat. So what does it mean for me to say I paint music? I have a form of synesthesia called chromesthesia, which means I see sound in color and shape and texture. I also have another form called tactile auditory synesthesia, which means I viscerally feel music. Tonight, I will paint my sense of the golden spiral, the Fibonacci sequence, and the butterfly effect, and chaos theory from the stimuli of all the presentations, the story, the poetry, and most certainly, the beautiful music. And now, Please let me introduce Serbi Butani, a math and computer science double major, presenting the butterfly effect in recursive sequences. I'm just going to take a moment to set up. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank you to Ofer for allowing me to speak on this beautiful, beautiful piece. So I'll be discussing some of the math that inspired this composition, starting with the Fibonacci sequence. So what is the Fibonacci sequence? Every number is the sum of the previous two numbers. Let's go through an example. 
So here are the first five Fibonacci numbers. Do we see a pattern? We're going zero plus one equals one, one plus one equals two, one plus two equals three, and two plus three equals five. Does anyone want to tell me the next one? Yes. Beautiful. And the next one, one more? Great job. <laughs> so while the Fibonacci sequence is unique, there are many other sequences that share its properties. This is because the Fibonacci sequence is recursive. Recursion is a fairly simple rule. It's just the repeated application of a rule, definition, or procedure, just like our addition op operation with the Fibonacci sequence. On the right, you'll see Carrie Mitchell's work, where she draws from geometry, fractals, and numerical analysis to create these recursive images. Really pretty, right? Um, note that while they look and were created in similar ways, each of them started at a different point, hence creating different works of art. This is where the butterfly effect comes in. Um, it explains why all three of those look so different despite using the same procedure. The starting point impacts the result. That's what the butterfly effect is. So, for example, both the fern here up on the top left, um, and the pine cone demonstrate the Fibonacci sequence. And yet, they're as different as they come from different seeds. Ofer's piece embodies these phenomena as the Fibonacci sequence represents order and the butterfly effect represents chaos. Now I'd like to introduce Zach ben Amatz for a poetic interpretation of the butterfly effect. All right, so hi everyone. Um, uh, up there you see something that's in your program as well. Um, I wanna give a little context for this. I'll be reading a poem, um, and the idea for the poem actually, it's a family affair. It originated with my, well, you know, my dad had the idea for writing this poem, but my brother, I had written, I had been thinking about the butterfly effect and thinking about chaos theory and thinking about a lot of the ideas that Sherby just, Sherby just uh, talked about and I was struggling to understand it, and I wasn't sure if I could explain it to myself. Um, without going too much into it, I was spending like a few days dedicated to thinking about the butterfly effect, and uh, like late at night, like in the middle of the night, I was like, I'm just gonna write it down as an essay and see if I can write down my thoughts on the butterfly effect, which is what you see. Now, I am not a mathematician or a physicist, so this is not uh, what it is. Uh, it's, 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 my understanding basically from Wikipedia. Um, but I, I wrote this essay and, and I think uh, I have it on, on good authority that it's at least informative um, and that you know you, you might enjoy it. Um, but then I went through the essay and I uh, took a random die of different, with different numbers on them, different number of sides, and I rolled the die and I would just go num word to word based on the number that I'd rolled and take out all the words in between. Um, so the, the lecture goes into, you know, the important aspects, Jurassic Park, um, all kinds of other things, uh, Ashton Kutcher, um, but, uh, the poem is just pulled randomly from the roll of the dice, and then I sort of finessed it a little bit, um, to make it work, but really very little, it worked out magically. So, uh, well, I guess you'll decide that. So here's the poem, Chaos. I predict a rounding error into being. Lorenz's weather model, a set of warmer, even to know the present, if we are anyway, if in, of, in, may be, hard to misinterpret, make it easy to misinterpret. Giving the butterfly, does flap a tornado? That a computer, the analogy a human error, great Lorenz seems to be small. Impact that it could know, Lorenz had no time care more and something small term. Even two factors confirm predict faith term models. Speech, in a way butterfly itself effect. One error, the though humble, it's been any study forever. The Ashton Kutcher reference culture. They be and deal in, sure, why not? Time travel fiction has any change equals chaos. 
turn, reframe predictions. Facts that are accelerating, shooting time for global economics, eye to basics. Chaos concept, hence Lorentz's factors, fractional dimensionalities, are tiny individual roots, the larger pattern of I to basics. That chaos measures forward, backward. That chaos as time, it worked. Decrease points, the past is the end. Chaos would be linear, I to basics. We too buy it, the events, Chernobyl not by off half, have a million years, to set my alarm, to cause an effect, our no will only precise we, our information, example people, out or seemingly in, we cannot weather. But work to local newsroom, pretty whatever, the seven day report is as accurate as we need it to be. Too far into, I'm myself, that's Jurassic Park, he's the butterfly, but I also could have predicted that. I hope you all enjoy that as much as my mom did. <laughs> um, so next up is, uh, is gonna be Sage Bear, who's a writer who's currently in Brazil on a Fulbright. Um, and she wrote a short story, and the full text of the short story is actually in your program. She's gonna read um, a segment of it, um, and I, I hope that you finish the story. I'm sure that you'll want to. Um, the end is really kind of a delight um, and kind of plays on the idea of the butterfly effect. So. Yeah, we'll get that up here. Spanish, 
when she knew the woman must be English. Gracias, she decided, lifting the wine in a pert toast. De nada, the woman responded warmly, giving S. Christie a look of kind complicity. The bookstore was dark and musty, all red drapes and mahogany bookshelves lined with shabby second-hand books. S. Christie ran her fingers over an old copy of Voyages in Translation, a travel guide to Peru, and the powder pink cover of a novel that she recognized from middle school. She imagined the travelers offloading these books before embarking on the next leg of their journey, academics and backpackers, rich families traveling with young kids. Please, the young woman said, touching S. Christie's arm, have a seat. S. Christie moved to the third row of plastic folding chairs. A total of 10 chairs were set up in uneven rows before a haggard looking podium. The other attendee was a man slumped in the front row. His brown hair fell in curtains around his face. He appeared to be sleeping. The young woman approached him cautiously, placing a hand on his shoulder. Sir, she said. Sir, the talk will be starting now. The man lifted his head in a jolt. Of course, he said. The man stood up, shaking his head slightly, and proceeded to the podium. He shielded his eyes sarcastically as he surveyed his meager audience. Well, he began, glad to see such a good turnout. Again, that was an excerpt from my story, La Valosa Troja. The whole story is available in your program. Thank you again, and have a great night. Definitely, definitely finish it. It's a, it's, it's in a really exciting story, and the action starts like right there, um, and it's a super funny ending. So thanks to Sage from Brazil. Um, next up, we have Dr. Shane Burns, a Nobel Prize winner and a professor of physics here at Colorado College, uh, to explain what this really is. It'll take me a second to get set up here. So let me start this very interesting presentation. There it is. There's the beginning. That's just so you don't get distracted by uh, by the, the nice graphics later on. Um, well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me over. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, it isn't often that I get to um, explore kind of a, a really beautiful concept in physics, like the butterfly effect, with physicists, mathematicians, artists, musicians, it's, it's a rare opportunity. However, it shouldn't be that rare. Um, it, it's the very exploration of those kind of natural phenomena that, that end up inspiring us. It, it ends up inspiring both uh, scientists and artists. So I always love this quote from Einstein. Um, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious is the source of all true art and science. And uh, this, this coming together of several different uh, disciplines, I think, is, uh, is uh, really inspiring. So it's, it's wonderful. We need to do this more often. Um, um, so what is the butterfly effect? Well, I'm going to tell you the story of Lawrence. Um, he, was, uh, he was the one that sort of coined the term uh, although in kind of a funny way if you really read the history, but most people credit him with the, the concept of the butterfly effect. Um, he was a mathematician and meteorologist in the 1970s. And the 1970s were an exciting time because he was uh, working with computers and realized that he could use computers to solve very complicated physics problems, one of them being the weather. He was interested in predicting whether, for example, in two months we could have 
a tornado in the middle of Oklahoma City at a particular time and on a particular day. That would be valuable information. That was the goal. Uh, you could uh, evacuate uh, Oklahoma City, take precautions, and maybe save a lot of lives. Uh, he was starting pretty modestly. He came up with a very basic set of equations that described pressures and, um, and uh, wind speeds and temperatures in the atmosphere. And he thought, starting with the initial conditions and just using the fundamental laws of physics, he should be able to predict exactly what was going to happen. Now, you may say that's a little arrogant, right? That's a big project. He was starting out modestly, but he thought he could probably do it in the end. Why did he think he could do it? Well, I'm going to bore you with a little demonstration here. Um, so this is a simple pendulum. If you've ever taken a physics course, you've seen this probably more than you want to. So it's just a, um, a weight on the end of a string in this case. The idea is that if I pull this weight out away from equilibrium and let it go, it's going to swing back. And I can calculate exactly what the position of this weight is going to be for all time if I know the starting conditions and I use the basic, some basic physics. Physics as old as Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was the one that came up with these fundamental laws and the laws that govern the weather are very much just Newton's laws. It's a more sophisticated set of Newton's laws. It's a big set of coupled differential equations. Sounds fancy, but fundamentally, the mathematics exists to solve those equations. The problem is those equations can't be solved by sitting down with a piece of paper and a pencil, the way you can solve the simple pendulum problem. You have to use a computer because you have to do the calculation numerically. <clears throat> so he coded up uh, the physics, entered it into a program in this computer, and uh, ran the program. And he was astonished because every time he ran this program with the same starting conditions, he got a drastically different result. Some days he got a nice day in Oklahoma City, some days he got a tornado without changing any of the physics, uh, and he thought without changing any of the initial conditions. For example, if I change the initial conditions on this just a little bit, say I raise it here instead of here, what does it do? swings back and forth in the same way. And it may change the result just a little bit, but not a lot. That's not what he was seeing. He was seeing drastically different changes. He finally traced the problem to the fact that his computer was inadvertently rounding the initial condition. And when it rounded the initial condition, sometimes it rounded it one way, sometimes it rounded it the other way. This is only, and the rounding error was only a fraction of a fraction of a percent, but he got drastically different behavior. And so he started to explore <clears throat> uh, the mathematics behind this. Uh, it turned out that there had been other scientists, uh, a mathematician, physicist by the name of Poincaré, that explored this at the turn of the previous century. And it discovered this extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. And uh, Lorentz was absolutely startled by that. Uh, so I want to try to describe exactly he, how even simple systems can exhibit this extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. Keep in mind, this is all completely deterministic. So to a physicist, even though we talk about chaos, we don't mean it in the sense that, that many people uh, think of chaos. We think of chaos as just being random, anything can happen. Well, chaos is, to a physicist, is completely deterministic. 
but there's this exquisite dependence on the starting point. So I have a little animation I'd like to show you. Uh, this is just another pendulum. It's much, much like my original pendulum. Uh, it's a little bit different, though, in that it has two masses. I wish this, uh, so let me uh, try to point this out. So this is the pivot point right here. These two red dots represent masses, and rather than just having a string on the pendulum, I have a solid rod between these masses. Now, if I took this double pendulum and did the same experiment up here and showed you, say I had another mass here, and I raised it just a little bit and let it go, it would behave much like this did. However, if I put the starting condition up here, I raise this mass way above its pivot point and let it go, I end up being in a range where the initial conditions produce chaos. And so this will illustrate that, and it will illustrate it because really this is three superimposed pendulum. I'm going to run them all at the same time. Uh, you can't see that they're different because the initial conditions are so slightly different that you can't see it on this scale. Okay? Very, very, very small changes in initial conditions. So let's go ahead and run the simulation. Whoops. What happened? Okay, let's go. Okay, they kind of go along together for a while, but then pretty soon, while well, one mass is over here and one mass is over here, uh, and they all started out from basically the same point. Basically, but not identically. Okay? So here's your tornado in uh, Oklahoma. Here is a nice sunny day in Oklahoma. It's exquisitely sensitive to those initial conditions. Um, so he, uh, he uh, thought this was fascinating. He realized that there was some physics behind it, and he started exploring this motion. I'll just let it, leave it running. You can continue to watch. It's kind of fun to watch. Um, small changes have a tremendous effect. The same effects uh, that he was seeing in his weather program. Um, <clears throat> so he made the analogy. Actually, he started out with an analogy. He, he started out with the analogy of a seagull, actually. And he said a seagull flapping its wings on the coast would... Uh, un, uh, un, uh, would, would change the future of the world forever. That was kind of the way he stated it originally. Later on, it got kind of refined to being, well, wouldn't it be nicer if it was a butterfly, <laughs> say, in Brazil? Okay, so the usual story is there was a butterfly in Brazil. The butterfly in Brazil flaps its wings and creates a tornado in Texas. Okay? Uh, now, it isn't as if the butterfly produced the energy that produced this tornado. No, that butterfly's flapping its wings just changed the initial conditions just enough for uh, a completely different result to occur. So that's chaos uh, from a physicist's standpoint. I think there's some life lessons in this, though. Um, first of all, Chaos is not randomness, okay? There is randomness in the world. Quantum mechanics says there's true randomness in the world. This is not it, okay? Chaos is purely deterministic to a physicist, but it's exquisitely sensitive to initial conditions. Uh, also, all is not hopeless for weather forecasting, right? Uh, but it means we need to think about weather forecasting in a different way. Uh, certainly, weather forecasts have gotten bigger since not better since 1970, right? We're able to forecast the weather better. But if you listen to a weather forecast, they say there's going to be a tornado tomorrow in uh, um, Houston at this address. No. They say there's a 30% chance that there might be a uh, tornado in somewhere in the vicinity, okay? 
Why? Because of this exquisite sensitivity to initial conditions. Even though we have weather stations all over the country, all over the world, that measure very precisely the initial conditions, they don't measure it precisely enough. Uh, what it maybe also means is we have to look at things a little bit differently. Newton very much looked at mechanics as, okay, I'm going to give a starting position and I'm going to watch what happens as time goes on. And I can predict from my equations exactly what's going to happen. Maybe we have to think about it a little bit differently. Maybe we have to think about what are the range of possible initial conditions and what initial conditions, what starting points are going to cause chaos and what aren't. So, I wanted to leave you with a pretty picture. So this is, um, this is a map of actually the starting conditions for those two uh, pendulums showing uh, the region where the motion is pretty much nice and periodic. That's the kind of white region in there. And, and then um, the colored regions, which is actually quite beautiful, uh, the colored regions uh, represent different degrees of chaos. So we can now explore uh, our systems by looking at diagrams like this rather than just trying to predict the future. The final life lesson I'll let you uh, leave you with is that small things do matter, right? So even a small thing that you do today can have huge consequences in the future. So that's about all I have right now. Uh, it's my pleasure now to, um, to welcome to the stage uh, Jamil Pollan. He's a, an assistant professor of art here at Colorado College, and he's going to tell us about order and chaos in a very unique way. Thank you, Dr. Burns, for that wonderful introduction uh, and for that presentation on, uh, on the physics behind the butterfly effect. Thank you, Kay. Um, Y'all able to hear me better? Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I really appreciate the way that uh, Dr. Burns left us off um, and, and transitioned into my portion because um, my work is all about uh, the interconnectedness of us and how interdependent we are um, on each other um, as individuals, as individuals within families, and as you know, people within nations and societies. Um, and so considering the ramifications of a butterfly flapping its wings on the weather conditions in Texas. Um, I thought, how much does that apply to uh, political conditions in other parts of the world? Say, a war in the Ukraine, a refugee crisis in Haiti, a refugee crisis at the border of the US, protests happening in Minnesota. Um, so this virtual reality scene is an immersive experience that explores the, uh, the political and the social uh, relationship between order and chaos. Um, each of these scenes, uh, to me, connotes um, some sense of trying to impose order and instead engendering chaos, or looking at something and, and describing it as chaotic, um, when there could be very rational um, ordered, measured political uh, actions occurring. Um, this is also a collaborative work. Um, in keeping with the idea of interdependence and interconnectedness, this is essentially a lightly uh, altered canvas, but essentially a blank canvas. 
and really requ requires the interaction of you all as the audience and viewers to complete this work. So in your program on the back page, there is a QR code and a link. Um, so if you would like to join this space and contribute to this space, um, your input is, is valuable. Um, if you scroll down to this cube icon that says place, you can select a pen tool and draw within this scene. I'm not sure if you can see that. There you go. You can add extra information to the scene if you'd like. Um, so you can pick several different um, items and construct the scene to your liking. Um, you can also place GIFs, take pictures, change your, your avatar or your digital body. Um, so I'd invite everyone to, uh, everyone who feels comfortable and, and uh, led to, to contribute to the work. Um, this work also has an audio component, so I will activate that portion now. Move the pen tool. me okay excuse me while I troubleshoot this scene Ooh. all right I may have to uh, reload this scene to make this link work There we go. All right. This room can also accommodate up to 24 simultaneous users, so it is also a, a social experience as well. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry. Um. So, there we go. Oh, there we go. All right, thank you.
That was some, uh, some parting words of wisdom from Bertrand Russell, um, very notable mathematician and uh, political dissident. So thank you all for, for listening to my section. And now I'd like to invite Ms. Susan Grace to uh, perform Alfred Ben Amot's uh, piece of the butterfly effect. Thank you. Hi again, such an exciting, so such a varied butterfly effect of presentations. Uh, I love it and I just wanted to say very briefly something before about this piece. So you do have the first page of my score in your, and, and you, you will see some random numbers, they're not so random, but they're actually Fibonacci numbers which I used. The, the piece is not based on the Fibonacci series in any way, but it is informed by those numbers. And um, this piece tells a story. So when you hear it, you can think about any kind of story. First of all, you will hear the flapping wings of the butterfly, and, or you can think about the, the, the COVID, or you can think about politics. Uh, any of these stories make your own story as you go along but you definitely feel that there is a chain reaction from one section to another. That every time that there is some, something developing and then it switches to the next level and it's somewhat toward the end, it's going to come to a, a standstill. It's like you will hear when the world has collapsed. So that will be... Uh, uh, but then out of this dark uh, sound that's coming, you will hear the butterfly coming again. So there is a little optimism there. So even our word is, might be going down the drain, the butterfly will come back. Okay, so uh, again, thank you, Sue. She prepared this well for me. <laughs>
if anyone has questions about the butterfly effect or any of the presentations, now is the time to ask, so uh, otherwise we can all interact <laughs> with the audience. So thank you so much for coming and thank you to for an amazing performance. And the, the painting that was done live on stage during Karen, bravo to you. <laughs> Boy, good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure a physics professor has a good answer for that. But yeah, I think that variations, very small changes in in the starting point, can have dramatically different effects. Um, yeah. So I suppose that explains part of why we're different. Why, why part of maybe why identical twins are, you know, they can tell each other apart and their parents usually can as well. You know, there's enough differences, even though they started essentially the same. So, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> the, the other interesting thing that I almost wanted to talk about, but, you know, I could go on for days about this, but uh, some have suggested that a marriage of quantum mechanics and, and uh, chaos theory could help explain why we have free will. Because Newton's laws are completely deterministic, right? If you believe Newton, we have no choice in our lives. You know, it was all set at the beginning with the initial conditions. But that fine sensitivity means uh, to initial conditions means if there's just a very small change at maybe a quantum level, that could change drastically the outcome. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing to explore, and there have been a number of physicists that have kind of explored it, and philosophers that have explored those ideas. But thanks, that's a great question. I'm yeah, great. Oh, can you have a question? question? Very much. <laughs> I'm lucky because I have such wonderful music to play. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm very familiar with that piece. Now, how would you rate the difficulty of that piece? Pretty easy, just a day, you know, just going through it. No, this was one of the more uh, harder works of Ofer's. So I complain to him a lot. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, um, I wasn't planning for it to be an ongoing series, but um, it's on the it's on the web now and it's open um, basically until I close it. So, um, if students want to contribute more to it, um, or if they want to just contact me and and learn some some ways that they can build their own uh, environments like that. Um, I'd be happy to be in touch with them. Thank you. Um. The first time I found out about it was not too long ago of what it was. 
I've had it my whole life. Uh, my father was a concert pianist, and I used to lay underneath his piano and wave my arms around, and my mother thought something was wrong with me. <clears throat> but I don't look as this as a, um, a detriment at all. I look as a gift. It's wonderful. It can be overwhelming at times. And only in the last, I say, 10 to 15 years, I've been painting music. Um, I have painted the landscapes and the horses and the flowers and all that. And I love doing that because there's, there's also those other sensory input then. Um, when I discovered what this was, uh, I did some research on whether or not I could actually paint classical music. And then I tried jazz and I've tried a garbage band is what they called it. Um, I painted Zach's poem, which is out <clears throat> excuse me, in the lobby, and also did a little illustration for the story. Um, so I just love doing that sound to sight type translation. Um, it's very exhausting, but because there's so much input. So thank you for asking. Now to put you on the spot here, where does that painting go from here? Um, first it has to dry a little bit, and then um, I have a dream of creating an installation project with 26 panels that will hang, large panels that will actually hang in a spiral. Now don't panic over. I want it to go around the piano <laughs> and uh, while the piano is playing then maybe have some visual screens that actually paint this whole music to the piece as it goes along in this giant spiral with different parts and pieces of the back of the panel that you saw. There's also some drawings out uh, of that in the lobby as well. There is, I don't think you can do 26 paintings. It's not a Fibonacci theory, it's a number. <laughs> <laughs> Either 21 or 34. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make it go around the piano instead of over the piano so it didn't fall on the pianist. <laughs> Any other question? You know, when I approached uh, my colleagues and my friends to uh, participate, um, I just told them about what the project is about, and I didn't want to impose on them any kind of thinking or, you know, you have to do this, or you have to tell Ken, you know, this is my piece and this is a structure, so please do this. Ken. I said anybody should take their own uh, approach to what the butterfly effect is, and what you get is so many varied approaches to this thing that makes it so interesting. So these are the, the, it's all about the same concept, but that so different. And that's what we call creativity. You think about the same concept, but everybody brings in something else, and that would bring the beauty of arts and science together. And I agree with uh, Shane that we need to do a little bit more of this collaboration. And so. It's a good question, so. Um, to put my own uh, spin on that answer, um, knowing that I was gonna be a part of a group that included Dr. Burns um, and Serbi um, made me want to put mathematics um, into the, the scene as much as possible. Um, so including Bertrand Russell, who's you know, one of my personal heroes, but also a very famous mathematician, um, was a nod to that relationship between the butterfly effect and mathematics. Um, and then in, uh, you can't really see it as well on the screen, but the enclosure for that VR scene is a, uh, a supernova, or it's, a, it's a, a, a map of different supernovae. Um, in outer space, which is another nod to uh, Dr. Burns's work. Um, so that, those are a couple of the ways that, uh, that I was influenced. I actually tried to sample Ofer's piece um, for the musical element 
but it was just too <laughs> too difficult to chop up. So. 